All right, so this is a classifications unit. Um, it is an entire standard, but it should be pretty quickly. Uh, we can go through this pretty quickly um, in a week or two. Um, classification of organisms is what we do so that we know where organisms are. Um, if we're trying to find out what an organism is, we know that it's going to be in a specific group. So a plant, a tree, should be grouped similar more closely to a mosquito than it, uh, than it would be a bacteria. Um, or a mosquito should be close... To uh, closely categorized or classified um, to a dragonfly because it's more similar to a dragonfly than it would be a mushroom um, or a fungus. So um, we classify things all the time in the grocery store, um, your sock drawer, your clothes, your dishes. Um, we classify things so that we can more easily and more readily find them. Here's a standard. Um, you can pause and look at this. Um, we're going to start up here at the top right talking about uh, ladder of nature, and then move down around this way. But this is the standard that we're going through. We're going to look at historical models of how this was done. And then um, more recent, the six kingdoms of life. There's actually seven now, but we still teach it as six. Um, they take one of these, that's the protist, um, and they split it up into two. But we're just going to teach it as six because that's how it is in the standards. Uh, and then we're going to develop and defend a model. So... What I'd like for you to do is look on your, um, in your slideshow, you'll see a slide that has a square and a box in it and it says classify your own, your animals. You can follow the directions at the top of this, but essentially what you're doing, I want you to make some kind of organization, some kind of classification so that all of the or these organisms can fit into a, one box. So you may have, you might, might want to have one with all plants in it, and then you might want to have one with uh, other large groups. Um, so where would a cat go? Where would a dog go? Where would a lizard go? Where would a, uh, an eagle go? Stuff like that. Think through what groups these things would go through. So you can pause it here and you can go do that. All right, so Aristotle's Ladder of Nature. This is how Aristotle, looking back at how you organize things, look at how Aristotle organized things. So what you're going to do here is um, you're going to put a check or an X. You can copy and, copy and then paste this into these boxes. So put a check if this trait matches with the organism that's down here, or the thing, the object here. Um, but uh, Aristotle kind of put all living, non-living things at the bottom of the stairs or the ladder, and then above that was plants and trees, and above that was animals, and on top, at the very top, was human beings. O almost in an organization or uh, steps of... Um, how complex or complicated things are, how advanced, maybe. Maybe that's how we saw it. Um, but uh, so down here for minerals, do minerals have the ability to reproduce? We would say no. So you put a red X there. Can they? Do they have the ability to move on their own? No. Do they think rationally? No. So these would be all three be red Xs. So go ahead and pause it here and fill out your chart. This is in your um, slideshow, and you can see the I can segment at the bottom. I can explain why organizing objects makes it easier for a large group of people to study things. And um, that's kind of what the theme is, um, classification. All right, so we've got, this is how it was historically. If you look up here in the 1700s, in the 1700s, they had two kingdoms. See, there's kingdoms. These are all the kingdoms. Two kingdoms. We had plants and we had animals. And we'll talk about why this is in Latin or Greek. These, all these words look Sim familiar, some of them do, but they're not exactly um, what we say. We say plant and animal. This is plantae and animalia. But there's only two kingdoms in the 1700s. And then in the late, late 1800s, they started categorizing protista, and I believe they categorized those on really small, tiny, microscopic animal-type things or plant-type things, so they just called it protista. In the 1950s, split it up into, they split protista up into um, protista and monera, which is kind of like bacteria. And they split plants into fungi and plants, which makes sense because fungi are not the same thing as plants. But forever, that's how we have classified them. Because if you think about it, fungi seem more like plants than animals. When in fact, fungi are actually, we're more closely related to fungi than we are to plants. Um, fungi don't have a stomach but they still digest stuff similar to us. And then we've got down here to the more recent. Um, you've got six different kingdoms. Um, and we'll talk about those as time, time goes by. But, uh, yeah, these are the different kingdoms. And they're now split up into empires or domains. We call them domains. And we'll talk about all that.
But point being with these two is that this is historically how some people have organized stuff. You can see kind of a succession. This is how things have been organized. Let me tell you a story. So when, my, when I was younger, my grandpa uh, and his grandpa and his grandpa and his grandpa all the way back um, until King Philip was alive, we had this saying in our family, when, you're, when somebody's doing something dumb, there seems, you ask the question, did King Philip come over for great spaghetti? And here's why. It's a thing of honor. King Philip came over to our house one day, um, a long, long time ago after there was a bunch of war. Uh, it was like a feast uh, coming together. Hey, we won the war. It was a big feast. And that feast was, was, took place at my great, 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 whatever, grandfather's house. And so whenever I was doing something dumb, my grandpa would always ask, you know, essentially like you're dishonoring our family. The king came over to our house for dinner, and you're dishonoring our family. So he would ask me, what? Did King Philip come over for great spaghetti? Well, that's an acronym uh, for Domain, Kingdom, Phylum, Class, Order, Family, Genus, Species. And that's the eight levels of classification. And this is not going to be something that I'm, that's hugely important where you have to memorize and know each one of the little different things. You do need to know the order of them. That domain is first and species is last and know the order of the ones in between. So I would use this acronym or an acronym similar to it. Did King Philip come over for great spaghetti? Um, specifically, you need to know domain kingdom and genus species. Those are the four most important ones, the first two and the last two. And go ahead and take notes on classification. You can put it in your own words. Classification is putting organisms into groups based on similar characteristics. Classification is putting organisms into groups based on similar characteristics and write it in your own words. Just as a side note, um, there are generators for acronyms. Um, so if you have, like, PEMDAS, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally, there's, there are uh, acronyms for, uh, I'm sorry, there's generators for acronyms. So if you ever need a, if you're studying something, there's a weird acronym that's not already a Please excuse my dear Aunt Sally, Sally acronym or a mnemonic device to help you remember. You can go online, and I, I'm guessing you Google acronym generators or something like that, acrostic generators, and they'll come up with 15, 20, 30, 100 different other people post their acronyms that they've used for that thing. So that can be really helpful. All right, so this is the tree of life. I've drawn this previously on the board, but this is the tree of life. So on the tree of life, this is every living thing has similarities with something way, way, way back here. Now, the three main areas you have bacteria, archaea, archaea bacteria, and eukarya. Now, this would be a domain, this is a domain, and this is a domain. All three of these are the main domains. If you remember, going back here, archaea, bacteria, and uh, eukarya. And you can see domain bacteria only has one kingdom, Archaea only has one kingdom, but Eukarya has four kingdoms. And that word Eukarya should be like a little flag, like that sounds familiar. What does Eukarya mean? Do you all remember? Eukaryotic. eukaryotic. Yes, Eukaryotic. So it has every kingdom on this branch of Eukarya has a nucleus in it. These other two branches do not. Now, do I think it would have been nice if we just had a domain Prokarya and a domain Eukarya? That would have been fantastic, but whoever... You know, scientists that, that decided this did not do that. All right, so let's talk about this. Where does your spoon belong? And this seems like a silly question. Um, but if I said, where does this spoon go? If I'm at your house and we're doing dishes and I'm saying, hey, where does this spoon go? And you say, earth, well, that's not helpful at all. If I said, where's your homework? And you're like, earth, that's not helpful at all. Um, so this is very, very general. And as you go down, this is more and more and more and more specific. So earth, our country, state, county, street, or the house, um, where in your house, which drawer, where at in that drawer. In the same way, you have each of these becoming more and more and more specific as you go down. There's only one type of organism in this group right here, one. In this one, there are thousands and thousands and thousands, tens of thousands. I don't know the number, but it's massive numbers. All right, so let's look at this. Like I said a second ago, some scientists decided that there wasn't prokarya domain, it was something else. But I would like to 
point out that this makes sense. The words here, they're in Latin. I think they're all in Latin. Um, these words make sense. So eukarya, the domain eukarya, guess what eukarya tells you about the organism. If they're in the domain eukarya, guess what you know about that organism? Their cells have a nucleus. Yes. What about kingdom? This animalia, what is this? They're animals, yep. Chordata, this one's kind of hard. It's the first hard one. Chordata. What is the first five? First five letters are cord. Do you have a cord on you, in you, on the back? Your spinal cord? So these organisms have a cord. They have a backbone. They have a spinal cord. Mammalia, this one may make you uncomfortable. This is a mammal. Mam, like a mammogram is a procedure where a female goes in and they actually inspect the female's breast and it's not a very is a very from what I understand granted obviously I don't have experience in this but from what I understand it is a very painful procedure um, the female's breast gets squished very very thin so that they, when they scan um, they can so that's called a man uh, what I just get mammogram ma'am mean is referring to this organism's ability to feed their young through breast milk that's a mammal. Ma'am. Yeah, carnivore. So guess what What everybody in this order, every organism in this order is? They eat meat. Yep. What is this? Y'all recognize that? Feline. Feline. Felidae. This is a panther and Leo. Now, if you'll notice, Leo is different than every other word above it because it's not capitalized. Y'all see that? Every other word has the first letter capitalized, but not Leo. Because a science, we'll talk about scientific name in a second. Scientific name of an organism is always um, a lowercase species. The first letter of the genus is capitalized. So the scientific name of this organism is Panthera leo. Panthera leo. Um, and leo is lowercase. And it's also in Latin. And it's also, when you write it, it's generally italicized. You can see over here. All the things we just talked about, the explanation of why those words are there. I love when science does this. I love when science says, hey, we're going to make these words easy to understand instead of something that's not as easy to understand. All right. Where would you expect these three organisms to split on this tree of life? Where would you expect them to be different than each other? The domain, do you think they're in the same domain? Yes. Well, do you think they're in the same... Kingdom? You think they're in the same phylum? No. Remember what phylum? What was the phylum on the last one? Chordata? Oh, yeah. So probably. Where do y'all think they split? Uh, Let's back up to here. So they probably all have a spinal cord, right? Do you think they're all mammals? Yeah. You think they're all carnivores? No. Well, no. no? Are they all felines? No, so somewhere in those three, they should split. Where do they split? Uh, uh, which which level of organization? Use those words. Uh, nope, not kind of the O. Uh, uh, order. This one's order. Do you remember what these stands for? What do these stand for? Domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. So they split over here on, these ones are rodents, the fox squirrel is a rodent, gray wolf and lion are carnivores. And then they split on the next one, right? They're not in the same family. So all of them are in the same class, none of them are in the same family. And this is the same thing we've been talking about. Alright, so scientific names. Binomial nomenclature. We've already talked about this. You can go ahead and write this. Or, well, hold tight, hold tight. Um, binomial nomenclature literally means, if you want to look at that name, or it means close to this, bi, uh, two name naming system. A binomial nomenclature means there's two names to this naming system. So what you need to write down is that it's dealing with the genus and the species. That's where it gets its name, genus and species. What languages is this in? It says right there, what is it? Latin and Greek. And that the genus is cap the first letter is capitalized and everything else is lowercase. It's genus and species is how it gets its name. You're going to write it down or type it out. Scientific names come from Latin and Greek. And the genus is um, capitalized and the species is all lowercase. 
All right, so you can you should be able to guess on some of these what these organisms are. Alligator, Mississippiensis. Alligator. Alligator. What about is this one? Squirrel. Squirrel. Uh, Squirrel. What's elephant. this one? Elephant. 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 Uh, Wolf. So these are scientific names of these animals. You know these animals, alligator, squirrel, elephant, and um, wolf. You know these animals, but you may not have known, you probably did not know it's their scientific name. So let's talk about scientific names and common names. We, you know these animals. If I were to ask you what this animal is and show you a picture, you would say an alligator. You would not say alligator mississippiensis. Um, oh, and also another way you can say alligator mississippiensis, it's a scientific name, you can say a mississippiensis, a dot mississippiensis, c dot lupus. And so common names, we call things by their common names almost all the time. Not all the time, but almost all the time. Have you ever heard of a polecat? Now, when I was younger, I remember driving around with my mom and her saying, man, I smell a polecat, and I didn't understand what she was talking about. It was always when there was some kind of bad smell. Apparently... Do you know what a polecat is? No. It's a skunk. And so she was using a common name that I had no idea what it was. No idea. But she understood. Now, she is my mom. We have a very similar language. I know how she talks. I know it's not like she's from Germany and I'm from here or she's from Asia and I'm from here. She, I should know the words that she, but I didn't. Then that kind of proves the point. Using common names can be very confusing. I can say a panther, and that might elicit uh, images of a jaguar, a mountain lion, um, a bobcat. Like it's all of those things that I just said were common names, and I may mean something, one thing by them, and you may picture a different thing. And so, a uh, polecat is also called a skunk. What about a tree rat? Y'all know what a tree rat is? Squirrel. I remember going outside when my neighbors were outside shooting their little pellet gun. It was, these were grown men, and I was in high school. And they were shooting their pellet gun or their BB gun and up into a tree that had no leaves on it. I could not figure out what they were shooting. But I went out there and asked them, and they said, we're shooting tree rats. And I was very interested because I had no idea what they were talking about. I was like, what is a tree rat? This has got to be a really cool. And they said, no, they're just squirrels. So I looked like an idiot um, because I didn't understand that their common name for a squirrel, their, their, the name that they used for this was a Tree rat, when most people, I feel like, use it as a squirrel. But what about in Germany? Let's say you're doing some research and you find out, you hear that there is a gland on a skunk that will actually help treat bad breath or balding or cancer or um, that weird disease where your second toe is bigger than your first toe. I'm just kidding. That's just genetics. But if it's going to cure something, if you're doing research on skunks and you only call them polecats, but in Germany, they call them, I don't know, some weird name. And in China, they call them a different name. Are you going to be able to use data from other people? No. Nope, because you don't know what they're, you're, you think you're talking about different organisms, when in fact they are genetically the same thing. So scientific names, what we talked about here, scientific names help us bridge language barriers. And like language barriers is in like English and French and... Um, uh, German, also language barriers like from me to my mom. She's calling it one thing and I'm calling it a, a different thing. So scientific names are important because it allows scientists all over the world to compare data on stuff that they're doing, research. Dichotomous key. Let me explain what a dichotomous key is. A dichotomous key is something that scientists use and other people use, but scientists use to help classify organisms, to identify and classify organisms. All right, so this is an example of a dichotomous key. Um, we'll, we'll work on it. This is halfway done. So if we have these three organisms, um, and we're trying to identify them, and we had no idea what their names were, we're looking for the names. We, In reality, this one is Bob, and this one is Susan, and this one is Jill, or whatever. Um, but we don't know that at the outset. So we need to figure out which one is which. So dichotomous key says wings... It has wings or it doesn't have wings. So we would put, yes, it has wings over here. And then no, doesn't have wings over there. And then when we get to here, we're going to have to ask another question. Um, another question we can ask is, uh, does it have um, legs, six legs? Six legs. And 
A dichotomous key, what a dichotomous key does every single time is it splits it up into two separate groups. So we'll say yes and no. And so there, that is a dichotomous key. It splits up into two every single time it splits up into two. So dichotomous key, I'll say it again. Dichotomous keys split into two every single time. So you can say wings and no wings, or you could say um, six legs or no, not six legs, or uh, smaller than a quarter, or same size or larger than a quarter, or something like that. There's, there's all kinds of different questions you can ask, and you can do this with shoes and markers and all kinds of other stuff. But that is a dichotomous key, and it can help you do that. And that's what just one version of a dichotomous key. Sometimes they can look differently. So here's an example. Here's the, another example. So this was the one we just did um, on the left, the one that's more of a graphic. This is the one that's um, more of a written out. So wings, does it have wings? If yes, go to question two. If then you're not even looking at this is not even a thing. You're not looking at that. So does the organism you're looking at have wings? If yes, go to question two. If no, then that's an elephant. If it, okay, so here's question two. Six, does it have six legs? If yes, it's a mosquito. If no, it's an eagle. And you can do this with 10, 15, 20, 1,000 different animals or organisms. Um, and it will help you identify that organism. So that's a dichotomous key. All right, so this last I will do today. Um, the domain. Again, you have three domains. There, you can also call them empires. Um, we're just going to call them domains. I've seen them called empires, though. But eukarya, all these organisms have a nucleus. And these four kingdoms are in the domain eukarya. Animals, plants, protists, and fungi, they're all in the domain eukarya. Bacteria have uh, its own kingdom, and archaea has its own kingdom. You bacteria are essentially the bacteria that you know about. If you've ever talked about bacteria, you're talking about you bacteria, almost guaranteed. RK is a different type of bacteria, and we'll talk about them. They're really, really old. Remember, RK means really, really, really old. Um, that's because these bacteria are really, really old. Not each bacteria, but they've been around for a long, long time. And the next time, we're going to get into the different kingdoms and what they are.